we want to look at lesson 12 in our <coughs> end times events and lessons here. This is uh, signs of the end. There's all kinds of uh, end time uh, signs, especially in the world in which we live. People are saying, you know, well, we see this happening, this happening, this is all pointing towards, you know, Jesus' return is, is very, very soon. In fact, I heard a, a preacher that I enjoy listening to said that he thought Jesus was going to be coming back in the next and within the next three or four years, and uh, he didn't really elaborate a whole lot on that, but there were things that are going on that he felt like uh, are pointing to Jesus' return, and I certainly think that as we look at our world, um, there are some really uh, bad things going on, but there have always been bad things going on throughout the world, uh, but Jesus does give us some signs, and so we want to talk a little bit about that and maybe some cautions as we look at that. I want to deal at the beginning here with uh, the uh, six classic signs, they come from uh, three major passages in the Bible. One is from Matthew chapter 24, where I'll take most of it. It's called the Olivet Discourse, Jesus' last real discussion with his disciples prior to uh, all the other things that will happen that last week of his, of his life. Also in Mark chapter 13, and the same events are recorded in Luke chapter 21. The first is that Jesus says there will be wars and rumors of wars. So in Matthew 24, 6, he says, You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. With everything that's happening with Israel right now, and maybe even uh, an expanded war that might take place with Iran, as Iran uh, through uh, uh, Syrian uh, Hezbollah uh, uh, terrorist groups and stuff had fired on there. And there that we see this idea, and some people are thinking, well, Israel's getting ready to go to war, and this is going to launch the war of Armageddon. But we need to be reminded that Jesus said that there's always going to be wars and rumors of wars. And I'm sure that when uh, World War I broke out, uh, there were people who probably were thinking, you know, that this is ushering in the end. And certainly with World War II, with everything that's going on, uh, as we were in Hawaii uh, the last uh, couple weeks ago for a vacation, went to Pearl Harbor, and one of the things they were talking about there at Pearl Harbor is we're at the uh, Arizona Memorial, seeing the beginning of at least America's involvement in World War II, and then the, the battleship, the uh, uh, USS Missouri, is right um, opposite that and got to stand where the end of World War II was signed, where Douglas MacArthur uh, signed the, uh, the treaty that ended um, World War II, the surrender of the Japanese uh, on the deck there. And one of the things that we saw was the discussion of 60 million people died in World War II. Uh, 50 million, they said, was uh, civilian casualties, uh, just a tremendous amount. And my point of all that is to say that people thought probably during that time that this must be uh, the end here, that we're leading up to, you know, this Armageddon and, and, and as bad as everything was, the conquering that was happening and, and the number of lives left. But Jesus says there's always going to be wars and rumors of wars. So we have to be cautious to say that that is not the only sign uh, that Jesus is coming, but he said that uh, even in this, he said, do not be alarmed. And so we ought to be cautious when we see wars happening, whether it's with Israel or not. And we're going to talk about Israel's involvement in end times views. There's a different view of the nation, the, the modern nation of Israel's involvement in end times stuff. If you're a premillennialist, premillennial dispensationalist, or if you're an amillennial view, which I tend to hold to, and that's that idea of the thousand year reign we discussed that in earlier chapters. But the classic sign is wars and rumors of wars. There's always going to be them, Jesus says. Don't be alarmed by that. Uh, nation's going to rise against nation. There's always going to be that kind of conflict. And we have seen that. We will continue to see that uh, and, and really until Jesus comes again. The second of the classic signs is this. There will be famines and earthquakes. Um, Luke adds some other things uh, in, into it. I think he uses the word pestilence and the idea is there's going to be some there's going to be natural um, problems in our world where we see famines and we see earthquakes or or volcanic eruptions or things like that. Just our natural world. He says in Matthew 20, uh, 24, verse seven, 
There will be famines and earthquakes in various places, and all these are the beginnings of birth pains. Now, what Jesus is saying here is that they might be maybe more frequent. We might see greater famines, uh, larger uh, areas affected by a famine, or more intensity of a famine, uh, or length of a famine, or earthquakes that are of varying uh, sizes on the uh, uh, scale there of destruction or whatever. And those may increase in, in uh, numerically as the numbers of them, or intensity, as I said, but those are the beginnings of birth pains. So it's a sign, it, it's a precursor, and we'll talk of the difference between sign and precursor in a minute, but uh, they are certainly things to be thinking about. The next one, Jesus says, is that there will be persecution. Uh, he says in Matthew 24, 9, Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. He also talks about that there's going to be a division with even within the family as father sons are turning on one another, mother, daughter, brother, sister. So, so there's going to be persecution that will come from within the family and there will be persecution that will come from outside of the family. And that persecution is going to come because of a stance for Jesus. So when you take a stand for the gospel message you're going to incur hatred from the world because the world hates jesus the world uh you know uh, hates the message of the gospel um and you think well why in the world would anyone want to hate jesus he was love and he was compassion yes he was all those things but he also said that he was the way the truth and the life and that no one would come to the father through him he was exclusive about heaven that jesus was the only gate that people would go through to come to God. And that is not a popular uh, teaching today, especially as you think in the world of Islam, they don't see Jesus as God, maybe a good prophet, but certainly not the Son of God. And uh, you get into other religions like uh, Eastern religions and uh, um, religions in, in, say, in India, for instance, where they have millions of gods, a pantheon of gods and all those different things. Uh, they, they reject that as well. And so... Uh, Jesus said that there's going to be persecution and we see that happening now It's a shame, but even in our own country where Christianity we were founded on on Judeo-Christian principles and 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 religious freedom as it comes to worshiping Jesus you, I just think you can't go back and look at American history and say that it wasn't because of uh, Christianity that and that uh, Founded our nation the the people who came here were not coming here just to see uh, goods for expanding their pocketbooks but they came to expand their ability to worship god in a way that they saw fit as the scriptures and the holy spirit uh, led them and that's what that's what founded uh, uh, america as far as the united states is is concerned but now we're moving away from that uh, where we want to take christianity and it's become like uh, the scapegoat when there's problems it's well the christians they're the they're the extremists and not the extreme views that we see of the of secular humanism uh, but christianity and it's the thing that's being persecuted you make a hard stand for christianity or uh, faith in the bible and and christian belief and you're going to find someone who's going to call you out on that when you say it's one man one woman marriage relationship you're going to be called out on that because it's like well uh, no, the Supreme Court has said this, as if that is the absolute law uh, for everyone. And it might be the secular law of the land, but it is not the moral law. Jesus said that it is better to obey God than to obey men. And remember, the apostles were beaten for that when they said, we will obey Jesus uh, over uh, obeying men. And so that brought persecution, and we're seeing that now. Another one, then, another classic sign is apostasy. We don't hear the word apostasy, but it is happening all around us. Apostasy is falling away from the faith. It is denying Jesus. It's denying the gospel. It's false teaching. That is apostasy. Matthew 24, 10 says, And at that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And we certainly see that now. There are a lot of people who are walking away from the church, especially uh, the uh, uh, generations following. You can go back and you can look at 
this is the greatest generation, right, that we call them the World War II generation. And then we have the baby boomer generation. And then we have the Gen Z or, or uh, Gen X generation, my generation. And then we have the millennials, the generation. We keep beating up on the millennials, but they're already in their mid 30s and stuff. We have a generation after them now called Generation Z. And now we're starting to look at a generation even after after uh, the Gen Z generation. But as you move from, from one generation to the next, the involvement of people in the Word of God and standing on the Bible is decreasing each generation. It's really getting bad as we go from Gen Z generation. I think the last time I saw and looked at that, it said about 60% or so believed in the Bible and believed in God and uh, things of spirituality, that sort of thing. And as you go from there to millennials, it gets down. I think it's somewhere in the 30s. And Gen Z is somewhere in uh, single digits to teens. That's terrible. That is absolutely terrible. And we need to be encouraging our uh, young uh, people, our high school age, our early college age, my kids, uh, uh, 22 years old and just turned 21. They are in that Gen Z generation and and John's and Katie had a, a website stuff called Journey Z that they worked on, and John's still carrying that forward to try to reach their generation for Jesus because they realize that so few of them believe in God. There's this apostasy, there's this falling away. And we see that even in the church itself. Established churches are now falling away from established teachings of God. I mean, look at the struggle that the Methodist church is going through right now with their adoption of. Um, uh, same-sex marriages and uh, same-sex uh, pastors in the pulpit and that sort of thing. I mean, these are against clearly the Word of God. And uh, so there's an apostasy. People are falling away. Paul talked about that to Timothy, that people would fall away and they would go after these doctrines uh, to uh, soothe their itching ears, he talks about. And so uh, and we see that more and more. There's some of the stuff that's coming out even of the Catholic Church that was kind of stalwart in holding the line on some uh, you know, classic views of things, even that is starting to be swayed. So along with apostasy then, we see this next one, and that is of false teachers. It sort of goes hand in hand with people falling away from the faith, but then people teaching false things. Matthew 24, 11, Jesus said, And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Now, when we hear the word prophets, we need to think about that uh, prophets uh, are not just people who are uh, telling of the future. We often think, well, a prophet, he's predicting the future. He's going to prophesy about future events. But many times prophets were just people who spoke on behalf of God. Uh, <clears throat> they spoke God's word to the people. If you think about the Old Testament, how it was set up, there was God. He would speak through a prophet. The prophet would speak to the people. And then there was the priest, and the priest would hear the words of the people and speak to God on behalf of the people, like bringing their prayers up to God. So the prophet was the conduit by which God's message got from him to the people, and the priest was the conduit by which the people's prayers got from the people to God. Now Jesus intercedes there, and he becomes our intercessor, so there's no longer a need for a priest because, uh, as Peter says, we are all priests and kings unto God. We can it, uh, speak to God through Jesus, our high priest. And so we have that. But God still used prophets to speak to the people in that sense. Uh, and so Jesus says there's going to be some of them, and there's going to be false prophets. There's going to be false teachers. And we see that now. As people are taking the word of God, then they're saying that, you know, things that Jesus said that we've always taken as foundational, they're saying that doesn't matter anymore, or Jesus didn't say that, or the Bible doesn't say that it's one man and one woman, or, uh, you know, we have this uh, gender dysphoria issues that we're dealing with now that are uh, popular here in just recent years, and people are endorsing that and saying, well, it's, God didn't create us man and woman, like we get to choose our sex and things like that. Lots of false teaching that is happening. All of these signs, I would say, have been fulfilled in the first century. There was wars that were happening in that first century. There was famines and earthquakes that were happening. There was certainly persecution that was happening in that first century. Um, apostasy 
There were people who were falling away. Paul would talk about in the first century men like Demas, who was with him at the beginning. When Paul writes his letter to Timothy, he says Demas has fallen away. He's fallen and ran after the world. He's gone back into worldly teachings. And there were certainly false prophets. There were false teachers. And Paul calls several of them out, especially like in the churches of Galatia. Paul calls the Judaizers uh, the false teaching that they were bringing, that a man had to come under the uh, act of circumcision uh, before he could become a Christian. And so those things were going on. The last one of the six classic signs is this, and that is that the gospel would be preached to the entire world. And uh, there is a case that you could probably make that that was even accomplished within the first century. We think about it now, uh, that the gospel hasn't reached the entire world, and it hasn't reached every area of our known world today. There are tribes that have not heard the gospel, they don't have the Bible in their language, and we have Bible translators working on that to bring that about, and uh, we're making forward uh, strides with that, and as technology rolls around, uh, some people have even claimed in the next uh, a few years, maybe within a decade or so, uh, that we will uh, have the Bible in every uh, language, you know, every tribe, every tongue, every language. Uh, now, whether everyone's going to hear the gospel, that's different, but it's availability uh, because of uh, technology now and being able to translate the scriptures into these languages is just so much faster than the old methods in which we used to have to do them. But let me give you some Bible verses to think about uh, this possible fulfillment at least the gospel being brought to the known regions of the world uh, prospectively in their day. In Acts chapter 17, verse 6, it says, But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other brothers before the city officials, shouting, These men have caused trouble, and here's the key words, all over the world and have now come here. So the idea that they thought they have preached everywhere, all over the world, and now they've come here. So there's a great dissemination of uh, uh the preaching of the gospel paul was preaching the message and it was getting all over and people realized man this message is is, is everywhere uh, paul also says in colossians 1 6 that has come to you he says all over the world this gospel is bearing fruit and growing just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood god's grace in all of its truth so all over the world uh uh, these might be just uh, colloquial type sayings. Maybe Paul is just uh, uh, Luke. Paul here, rather, in Colossians, is writing. You know, it, it might be sort of a, a euphemism of saying, you know, this is everywhere. But a, an argument maybe could be made. He says again in Colossians one twenty three, this is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. That's the strongest of the verses. Paul says that this gospel message has been, that is meaning a completed action with an ongoing effect in Greek. This has been proclaimed and continues to be proclaimed, continues to have an effect to every creature under heaven. So Paul is probably thinking that at least regionally the gospel has gotten out. Paul's gotten to Rome. The gospel message is getting in the Roman world, which would have included coming over uh, down into Spain, into uh, the Germanic areas. Rome had control of, of Germania, so the Germanic tribes, even as far as Britain, Britannica, uh, Hadrian's Wall, the Romans build uh, dividing barbarians. And so the, the gospel message was reaching in, in the Roman Empire as far as into, uh, into Europe. We know that Thomas... Uh, took the gospel and went in into uh, uh, to the east and up into uh, India and into Asia and bring the gospel there. We have the gospel that was traveling down uh, into Alexandria and into the continent of Africa. And so the as far as continents go, other than you're thinking like Australia, uh, but the gospel message was reaching into Europe. It was reaching into Asia. It was reaching into Africa. Uh, those were known worlds at that time. And by extension of preaching into those areas, it eventually will get into uh, uh, further areas where it eventually gets brought over uh, into the Americas. It gets brought into Australia later through history. But we're still reaching people in South America, obviously, and tribes there, and tribes in, in, um, 
in, in jungles in Africa. But all of these were the classic signs. Wars, rumors of wars, famines, persecution, apostasy, false teachers, and the preaching of the word. These were signs that Jesus said, you can look at these things and you will know that the beginnings of birth pains have happened and God is getting ready to do his next, his next, major, his next major work. Let's talk about the difference here between signs and precursors. A sign clearly points to an event and indicates its timing. And an example of that would be the sign of Jonah. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 39 and following, he answered this being Jesus. He said, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And so you know that Jesus was executed on the cross. He was crucified. He was taken down. He was placed into the tomb. He was in the tomb three days and three nights. And so the sign of Jonah was very precise. Three days, three nights in the belly of the fish. Three days and three nights in the heart of the the earth that was a sign when you saw jesus had been in three days and three nights you would have known that jesus's words were true he prophesied he said this will happen and this event did happen that was a very specific sign uh, to the people and the sign was that jesus is the son of god because he will be here for three days and three nights and then he will rise to life just as jonah was vomited out and regained uh, life so to speak and continued to work and uh, go and to preach the, to the people of nineveh so that's a sign but what is a precursor a precursor would simply precede an event and build anticipation for the next event to happen and so when we think about a sign a sign says like uh you know maybe it'll say like a uh, stop sign on your you're driving right stop sign ahead you know, here's a sign, the next thing you're going to encounter is a stop sign. But a precursor sign in driving might be like a curvy sign that'll say, there's going to be some curves ahead. It doesn't mean that the first curve is going to curve to the right or curve to the left, although sometimes we have those signs. But if we have that wavy sign, it's just saying, there are going to be some things ahead of you, right? That's a precursor kind of idea. Uh, it's not very specific. It's just saying there's some things that are happening and then and they're going to happen first and then this event will happen and so we have many precursors the events of matthew 24 mark 13 and luke 21 are a combination of both signs and precursors for instance wars and rumors of wars would really be a precursor because it doesn't say what war or what nations will be warring or what time they'll be warring or in what century they'll be warring you're going to have these things, and they're going to happen before Jesus comes back. A sign would be like the sun and the moon and the stars, the heavens will be shaken. There's, there's some very unique things that Jesus talks about in that uh, Matthew 24 Olivet Discourse. Those are signs uh, over precursors, and so there's a difference. Uh, with that, I would say this, that there is a uh, deliberate ambiguity meaning there's a deliberate uh, fogginess, uh, blurriness, you might say, about these things. And that means that they were purposely, purposely left unclear so as to keep the timing of the second return a mystery. Jesus said that no one knows the time or the day, only the Father in heaven, right? And he's not going to tell us the timing of his second return because if everyone knew the timing, they would live, <clears throat> we would, you know how we would do this, we would naturally live sinful lives all the way up to the very end, uh, right before Jesus comes back, and then we would all give our lives to Jesus and be saved. We know that because when people go away, we procrastinate, right? We proc procrastinate in college, we go, here's the syllabus, the paper's due on this day, and we wait until three days before or you know, a day before, the night before, and uh, then we try to hurry up and rush the paper, or we hurry up and prepare for the exam. I've told you the story before. As a kid, my parents would go away sometimes. Oftentimes, my mom and dad worked at night, 
and mom would go away and she'd say, you know, I want X, Y, and Z chores done when I come back. And we would sit and play and th- until we heard the car door open and then we hurried up and tried to, you know, cram everything in the closet or under the bed and look like we had, you know, completed all the chores uh, of all of that. We wait till the last day. But with an ambiguity, not knowing exactly what uh, event fits what precursor or what sign, it encourages us all to live each day in anticipation and in readiness. Today might be the day. This very hour might be the hour. And that's what uh, precursors and signs in ambiguity uh, do for us. All right, let's move on to point number three. Jesus gives signs and precursors to the end, but the end of what? That's really the question here. The end of of what? Well, a couple things in that in that text there one is it is uh is it just about jerusalem and the temple when jesus answered questions and says that is he just talking about the end of jerusalem as a city of the destruction of the temple or is it just about the end of the world is that what he's talking about it's just the end of the world uh the best understanding i think and we're going to break down this passage here in just a minute is that jesus is talking about both of them He's talking, he's going to answer their question about when will this happen and what's the sign of your coming. He's going to answer both questions about Jerusalem and his sign of his coming and some think maybe even a third question, uh, the end of the world. The apostles were asking about the end of the world in that 24 passage. You can read it. We're going to read it in a minute. Um, Because in their minds, honestly, the fall of the temple would be the end of the world. Like, Everything is changing. If the temple is gone and destroyed again, then everything is, is changing. And uh, so they kind of saw those two events maybe side by side. So let's deal with this. Let's deal with the, uh, the two questions. And some would say that there are three questions that the disciples ask. The first is, when will the stones of the temple be torn down? Because Jesus said these stones, there'll become a day. When they will be torn down, they will not uh, be on top of one another. Question number two would be, uh, what will be the sign of your coming? And the third question, or maybe an addendum to the second question is this, and what are the signs of the end of the age? Certainly there's a question with the temple. And then the second question, or possibly question two and three are combined together, the sign of your coming and the end of the age. Now, let's put the Bible to it and... And read here matthew 24 2 do you see all these things he asked i tell you the truth that no one stone here will be left on one another everyone will be thrown down and just as jesus was sitting on the mount of olives the disciples came to him privately and they said tell us when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age all right so there's where the questions come from and that leads us into then jesus's answer here of the ending of the temple and the signs of his coming and maybe even signs of the end of the age however you under understand that so matthew 24 verses 4 through 14 as he begins his answer probably speaks to both the second coming and the end of jerusalem let's read it and see what you think here jesus answered Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am Christ, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, classic sign, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. So that's not the, that's a precursor, it's not the only sign, the idea, because there's still things to come. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquake in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains, and then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me, he says. And at that time, many will turn away from the faith, this is apostasy, and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets, we mentioned that, will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will go cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. 
So clearly in that passage, we have things talking about uh, the second coming, and we have things that are going to be talking about uh, Jerusalem. It seems like he's dealing with the end of both things. As he continues on, and he goes and speaks from verses 15 to 22, it seems that 15 and 22 are clearly focusing on Jerusalem, and it's mainly because he's going to tell them to hide. So let's read here uh, 15 down to 22. He says, so when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation, and we're going to deal with what that means uh, in next week's lesson, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. That means let the reader, uh, when you see this, refer back to Daniel and then put the pieces together. Then you'll understand, okay? So he says, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the roof go down into, uh, to take anything out of his house. Let no one in the field go back and get his cloak. And what he's saying is, do not waste time. Get out. Don't waste time. It's like when you're on the airplane and it says, in an event of emergency, do not grab your luggage, right? Just get out of the airplane. That's what he's saying here. Let no one in the field go back and get his cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in the winter or on the Sabbath. And he says, For there will be great distress, unequal from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. So he's, he's talking about what's going on in Jerusalem here. He tells them to flee the city and there's going to be this terribleness that's going to come upon uh, the city and eventually jerusalem would be surrounded by uh, the roman uh, general and later he'd become emperor titus uh, in ad uh, 69 and 70 uh, and they fall and jerusalem falls in ad 70 the temple is destroyed and jerusalem is ransacked and a lot of killing takes place just a lot of terrible things there's a fulfillment there the next section then he deals with from verses 23 to 28 uh, is kind of ambiguous. Not exactly sure what he's talking about here. Parts could refer to both the second coming and the end of Jerusalem or one or the other or both of them. While verse 27 is clearly speaking of the second coming, we know that, but verse 28 could be speaking of the destruction of Jerusalem and talking about the corpses that will certainly be left behind in the siege. Now let me uh, read the scripture here so you know uh, what we're talking about here. He says, at that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that were possible, he said. Now it's interesting he says that. He says there's going to be a lot of people who say, they're Jesus, they're the anointed one, they're the Messiah, and they're going to perform some great miracles and they're going to look like true miracles, but they're not going to be miracles. And he tells them, don't be deceived by that. And even the elect, the chosen people of God, he said, might be deceived if that's even possible. Which means, if you really understand the scriptures, and you know to be on the lookout of false prophets and false miracles, things that look like miracles but aren't true miracles, don't, don't be sucked into that then the elect's not going to be deceived. And I think that's what he means by if it's even possible. I don't think it's possible for a true believer of God who understands the Scripture, who's discerning of the Scriptures, uh, to be uh, duped in this way or deceived. I think that's what he's saying here. But back to the text in verse 25. He says, See, I have gathered you ahead of time. So if anyone tells you, there he is, out in the desert, do not go out. Or he is... In the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as lightning that comes from the east is visible, even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. So all of that stuff seems to be talking about the second coming. But then he says this here, wherever there is a carcass, there the vultures will gather. And what is he meaning there? Well, some say, well, that's the battle of Armageddon. Well, he could also have been referring to the, the death that was going to happen uh, at Jerusalem. When you see the vultures there, you'll know that the destruction happened, that the city, because he told them to flee, 
So the only way they're going to know that bad stuff's happened in the cities when they start seeing all the birds, all the vultures flying around, they know Jerusalem's been ransacked. They've lost the battle. There are dead bodies there. The birds of prey are coming down and consuming the bodies there. My point of all that is that you can see that in this passage, it's a little ambiguous as to what each verse and what sentence Jesus is saying, whether it's for the uh, end times answer or is it answering uh, uh, when Jerusalem will fall. Uh, Maybe it's a little bit of both. And then we come to verses 29 through 31. It's most certainly speaking about the second coming. These are cataclysmic events that are seen in the heavens. This is what I would consider uh, a sign because uh, they're pretty definite. When you see the stars start moving around or the sun and the moon are now shining in a different way than than normal, uh, you know something's going on. Not not just an eclipse as we've obviously just experienced here. That's regular, that's cyclic. It's cyclical. Uh, We know when it's going to happen. We can predict it. These are things that are happening that are unpredictable. They're anomalies. They're definitely God's trying to say something's going on uh, here. And so these are what I call cataclysmic events in the heavens, and that suggests judgment over everyone, over the whole earth, because those events affect the whole earth, not just um, an event that's affecting just Jerusalem. So let's read the Bible verses here. And put this together. Immediately after the distress of those days, now I think what he's talking about is the, the distress of, of uh, uh, when things increase, uh, the distress of when sin and apostasy and all that increase. Immediately after, just following uh, those days when things are really, really getting bad and people are like, man, where in the world? is the influence of the church and the influence of God. Uh, Because an argument can definitely be made that as we approach the coming of the day of the Lord, that things are not going to get better and better and better, but rather things are going to get worse and worse and worse. As the prince of this world ratchets up uh, his influence, you know in the book of of Revelation, right, that that Satan is released, uh, you know, from that bondage, right, thousand years, and then he's released, uh, so whether you see that as a literal thousand years or just a long period of time, but towards the end of that time, whatever that is, there is a releasing of Satan in that Revelation 20, and he's able to influence the world in a negative way, maybe even greater than he had before. We don't know why. Maybe Jesus, maybe God is having a final uh, purging or testing of, uh, of true believers. I, I don't know. But I think that's what he's talking about here. Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. There is going to be something cataclysmic uh, in the heavens that we're going to know God is changing things up. Kind of like when Jesus died, there was an earthquake, you know. Uh, There was a violence, there was a shaking and rock split, you know, because of what had happened. The very Son of God had died. Well, if the Son of God is getting ready to come back again, it would only make sense that God moves in a great way when God Himself, through the Son, Jesus, the incarnate God, is coming back to earth, that the world would have this uh, shaking thing, and that's what's happening here. In verse 30 it says, At that time... The sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. And this is probably talking that Paul picks up when he says, when he comes back, he comes on the cloud and the angels come with him and everything that's talked about in uh, the Thessalonians uh, 4 uh, passage. The man will appear in the Son of Man will appear in the sky and all of the nations will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet and they will gather his elect from the four winds and one from the heavens, uh, from one end of the heavens to the other. Clearly, all of that passage there is talking about, obviously, the second coming. There's no way to deny that. And then we have, as he continues on, verses 32 through 35. And the most logical view here is that this is the end of Jerusalem based on the statement that Jesus says, uh, these words, this generation. And John was certainly alive to see 
the Romans come into Jerusalem because John writes the, uh, the book of Revelation on the island of Patmos somewhere in the 90s. John is probably somewhere in his 90s, early 90s. So John was alive for at least about 20 years after the fall of Jerusalem. So that generation that Jesus was talking to was still alive to see the fulfillment of the fall of uh, Jerusalem. Now, let's put some Bible to this to see what I'm talking about here. Jesus would continue on this Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, verses 32. He says, Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near, right at the door. Right? When you see these things happening, Jesus is saying, you, you, know, you know it's drawing near. Doesn't, now, how, how close is near? I mean, I might be near to some of you in these first pews, but I'm not as near to those in the back pews. So this is near, but that can also be near if there's someone who's in the, you know, in the fellowship hall. You know, you're nearer than the people in the fellowship hall. You in these pews would be nearer than those pews. And depending on who I'm talking to, I could say, well, they were near, but they were near. Or even people in the fellowship hall were near opposed to people who aren't even in the church. So it's, it's, what I'm saying is it's relative. The word near is relative. So how long does it mean to say that the, that the uh, day of the Lord is near? I don't know, but I, I know that it's closer than yesterday. And these signs and these things happening, Jesus says, you can read what's going on and see like, okay, we're at least progressing in this direction and we are getting nearer to the return of Jesus. He says, I tell you the truth, this generation, verse 34, this generation will certainly not pass away until these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Jesus is going back and forth in his answer between answering things about the second coming and answering things about the destruction of Jerusalem. The second coming things are not all going to be seen by this generation. John and all of them, they've, they've died, right? They're, they're dead. They're, we know that. Jesus hasn't come back. It's 2024. So we know that that's not what Jesus was talking about. But we know historically that Jerusalem did fall in the lifetime of, the, of some of those of that generation, and John was certainly uh, one of those who saw it. And other men who were of John's age, who were of John's generation, uh, other Christians, they saw that happen as well. And I, th- so it's clear that Jesus is talking about those things there at the end of uh, Jerusalem. And then I think it's just an overall statement of heaven and earth will pass away. Now he's moving beyond that, but his words won't. The idea is that all these things are going to, Jerusalem's going to fall away, the heavens are going to be shaken, and, and as Paul, or as Peter will talk about, the heaven and earth pass away. There's a destruction by fire, right? The elements will be consumed and melt in the heat, you know, and, and we've talked a little bit about that last week with heaven. I think there's a burning off. Things are changed, and things are probably put back, restored, or recreated the way God wanted them to. And I think Jesus is reminding them that everything is going to change, guys. But the one thing that won't is my words. The things I prophesy, the things I preach, they're going to happen. And the things I've taught will not change. That God is sovereign. That Jesus is the Savior of the world. That He's the only gateway to God. That uh, love is that thing that endures. And, and, and righteous living. Like None of the things that Jesus said, no matter what is going on around you, Jesus is saying, None of these things are ever going to change. All right, let's move here into point number four. And let's talk about apostasy a little bit and uh, false teaching. Of all the signs of the times, these get the most attention, especially in premillennial dispensationalism. People love to focus on Look at the falling away that's happening in the church and look at the false teachings and Jesus is right around the corner. He's going to come in the next 20 years. Things are so bad and and, and we can get on that that bandwagon. But we need to realize that this was going on in the first century church. So it's not new to our 21st century. 
that apostasy and false teachings were going on in the first century church. They were happening in Timothy, or Paul writes to Timothy. He says, the spirits clearly say that in the latter times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose conscience have had their, uh, whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believed and know with the truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God in prayer, he says. He goes on to say this, if you point these things out to your brothers, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus brought up in the truth and in the faith and of the good teachings that you have followed. So in this listing here where Paul writes this letter to Timothy, he tells him things that are going on and he says, we know that in the latter days, okay, as time moves from the, from the uh, preaching of the gospel, uh, beginning of the church age, until Jesus comes again, we're moving in time. As time moves from this point to this point, the closer we get to Jesus coming again, we're going to start seeing these things. Well, this point is close to Jesus. This point is close to Jesus. This point is any point from, from Jesus back to the beginning of the church, is closer to Jesus than the beginning of the church. All right? Hope that makes sense to you. And so in the latter days, which means any day after Pentecost, after the establishment of the church, is the latter days. We're in the last days before Jesus comes back. Because after Jesus ascended back to heaven, there is nothing else for Jesus to do but to come again and receive the church. He is waiting while we preach and, and share the gospel message with the world. That's God's plan, and that's what the church is sent here and established here to do, right? Go into all the nation, make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. Go out, preach, make disciples, baptize them, means make them believers, uh, in, in a relationship with Jesus, and then teach them to continue to live uh, godly and righteous lives. And so Paul is saying there's a time in the latter days where people are going to stop doing that. And some of the things he talks about here are the uh, dietary laws that they're trying to put back on people and tell people that they shouldn't get married and different things like that. And we know that that happened in the first century because Paul had to deal with that. Paul tells Timothy to point out the problems to the congregations that he's preaching to at that time about some of these issues that were going on. That's what he's saying even in this letter, right? If you do these things, if you point out these problems to your brothers, you're a good minister. If he's pointing out the problems, that means Paul knows that they are already in the church. He doesn't say, well, whenever these problems arise, Timothy, you know, you're, you're probably going to have to preach on that. He says, if you point out these problems, you'll be a good minister of Christ Jesus, brought up in the truth. And then we also know that these were problems in the church because Paul addresses these issues with both the church of Corinth and the churches of Galatia. The church of Corinth was a church that had problems. They were uh, about being married, and Paul talks about being married. It's good not to marry and different things like that. And he gives reasons why, because of persecution, but it's much stronger, at least in the book of Galatians, when he says some of you, are, you, were, you were trying to establish dietary laws. You were trying to establish circumcision. That was the mark of bringing the law on them. And Paul says, don't do that. That's false teaching. You don't have to become Jewish to become Christian. And he says that circumcision means nothing. In fact, he even goes so far as to say, if you think circumcision means anything, I wish you'd go all the way and not just cut off foreskin, but just emasculate yourself. And so Paul was dealing with that issue in the first century church. Also, Paul deals with that again in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. He says these words here, <clears throat> But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, 
having a form of godliness but but denying its power, have nothing to do with them, he says. They are the kind who warm who worm their way into your homes and gain control over weak-willed women and are loaded down with the sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil, always learning but never able to acknowledge the truth. <clears throat> Just as James and Jambres opposed Moses, he says, so also these men oppose the truth, men of depraved minds, who as far as the faith is concerned are rejected. But they will never get very far because, as in the case of those men, their folly will be clear to everyone. Now, a strong case can be made that these behaviors will certainly increase as the day of the Lord approaches. I think we see that. Jesus said the hearts of men will grow cold, right? And we see that now. People don't seem to love one another. We're fighting with one another. Our our society is breaking down our families are breaking down i mean common decency is thrown out the window look at all the road rage we have and all the things that are going on you could make a strong case to say these things are certainly increasing in our world today you know uh and and i even realize this and see this even in my short 50 years of life i mean when i was a kid in the church and i i didn't really become a christian until i was 12 i was started going to the church and in Uh, regularly when i was in fifth grade when we moved out but i mean you know the preacher was a respected guy right uh and i called him you know uh i called him the preacher or or uh you know the pastor um but you know i never said hey rob you know that was my my preacher's name rob ford i didn't i didn't say that to him but now uh in the years that i've been preaching in the 25 years or so that i've been preaching uh I've watched things change when I uh, teach VBS and stuff. The kids are just very disrespectful. Uh, there's, no, there's no respect as being a preacher or being a Sunday school teacher, an elder, or even a teacher in school, right? I mean, you see the disrespect. So things are changing. Uh, and, and you might make a case of, you know, where increasingly behaviors are getting worse as the day approaches. But I want to just say this. That kind of behavior has always been present. It was present in the first century church. So it's not necessarily a clear sign of the end, but it is a precursor that ordinary behaviors, uh, wickedness is going to increase. There's always wickedness, but it might increase. Uh, <clears throat> another passage in which we see this is in uh, the passage of, of Second Peter. Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I have written both of them to remind and stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. First of all, you must understand that in the last days, okay, when are the last days? We've discussed that. But in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is the coming he promised? Ever since our fathers died, everyone goes on as uh, as, as it has since the beginning of creation he's saying we just keep going through life and nothing has changed but they deliberately forget that long ago by god's word the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of the water and by water these waters also the world at that time was deluged and destroyed by the same word present by the same word the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Now, Peter is saying, remember that people were saying when Noah was building the ark, why are you building the ark? There's no rain, there's nothing going on, everything's fine, all the way up until the rain came. The building of the ark was a precursor. Something is going to happen. And Peter is letting us know that when Jesus comes, it's going to be that same way. People are going to be like, man, Jesus hasn't come back yet. He isn't going to come back. And that was going on in the first century church. There were Christians who were saying, Jesus hasn't come back yet, not on our timetable. And so he's not going to come back. And that's why Paul has to write the letter to the first book of Thessalonians to the church of Thessalonica. Because there were some Christians who just stopped believing that God was even going to come back. They're like, forget it, we've missed out on that. And that's why Paul says about the return of Christ, I don't want you guys to be misinformed. And he talked about, 
uh, how Jesus will come in the sky and that uh, the dead will rise first and then we who are still alive will be caught up to be with Him. All those passages we read in the earlier weeks of our study. Paul writes that because in that first century, people were already saying He's not going to come back. My point is that Peter said in later times these things will happen. People will start saying, man, Jesus hasn't returned yet. He's not going to. We're saying that now in the 21st century sometimes. They were saying that in the first century because it had just been a few uh, number of years, maybe even a few decades since Jesus had uh, ascended to heaven. He had come back and they thought, well, he's not coming back. And finally, let's look at another passage here. In Revelation 16, 12, he says, The sixth angel poured out his bowl of the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the king from the east. And then I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. They are spirits of demons performing miracles, miraculous signs. And they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for the battle on the great day of God Almighty. Now this passage seems to indicate an increase in evil in the last days, right? He pours out this bowl on the great river Euphrates, is dried up, preservation uh, was prepared for this for the king, so this battle to take place. Evil spirits that came out of the frogs, and the, the nations are starting to uh, uh, get ready for war. Now, Dr. Cottrell, who's now gone on to be with the Lord a few years ago, who was the uh, professor of theology in the seminary uh, of Cincinnati Bible College. He suggested that we should view this battle as not solely a physical one, but more as a spiritual one. Remember that Paul said, that clarifying statement, that our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and evil spirits and evil dark forces of this world. He says that in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 12. We, we, we know that passage well, at least the, the general content of that. We need to understand that sometimes people are looking that there has to be this great physical battle that's going to take place. But God's biggest struggle is not a physical battle with men, with bombs and tanks and bullets. God's battle is a battle for the heart and the soul of mankind. Satan does not care whether a person is killed on a battlefield by a bullet. Satan cares if a person is killed spiritually. He wants people to deny God. He wants people to to suffer the second death. It's not the first death. All of us are going to suffer the first death until Jesus, unless Jesus comes back. Right? Is the point of man wants to die and then face judgment. Death is going to come. Satan's not worried about the physical death as much as he's worried about the spiritual death. And so where would the battle then most take place? In the spiritual realm. And so I think that we need to think about when we see all these battles and stuff, stuff coming out there and we go, well, this is, you know, this is new. Well, it's the spiritual battle, I think, that's more important than the physical battle there. There's an increase on that. There's an increase on that, and that is we know here in Revelation chapter 20, verse 7, it says that when the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison. He will go out and deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. That seems to be talking about what we just read, right? The bulls poured out and everything. Battle getting prepared. To gather them for battle. In number, they are like the sands of the seashore. It seems that the people, that maybe the demons or whatever that Satan is gathering, to bring about this demonic influence just seems overwhelming. And I think that's what's being described here. So certainly there's the possibility, and I think a very strong possibility, that there's going to be a greater deception, a greater apostasy as we get closer to the day of the Lord. That'll certainly tell us the day of the Lord is coming quickly. All right, two last things here. I know we've ran about an hour or so here time-wise. Let me give you two last things here. One is, let's talk about impotent signs or powerless signs. The problem with seeking signs is this. What do you do if your signs fail? You lose all credibility. And so what people have done is, they'll say, well, it's the same sign, but they give a new guess. Well, we're still looking for this battle, 
but it's not going to be Russia and China. It's going to be somebody else now, you know, uh, or it's going to be in some different location now. So they try that. Or the what happens when you say like, well, the Antichrist comes and you name the Antichrist and it ends up not being the Antichrist. Many thought that Hitler was the Antichrist during World War II, or they thought that Mussolini maybe was it. Both of those men were killed, and, the Jesus, and Jesus didn't return. When I was a kid, uh, we thought it was um, the guy from Libya. Uh, his name slips in my mind now. Uh, but uh, he was killed, Right? And then we used to think like, well, it's Mikhail Gorbachev because he had the birthmark on his forehead. And so we said, well, he's got the mark of the beast and he ended up not being it. And then we said that it was, uh, you know, Saddam Hussein. And he was hung because of war crimes and he ended up not being it. You see, when we start to say and label that it's this person and then they turn out not to be it, it's you lose a lot of credibility. So that's the problem with with picking a specific thing when jesus was ambiguous about it so to understand some signs that aren't weak when god gives a sign it will be clear it will be distinct and it will work now let me give you a bible example of how that's done in isaiah chapter 10 7 verses 10 it says and again the lord spoke to ahaz ask the lord your god for a sign whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. And then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of men? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. God wanted Ahaz to ask for a sign, but Ahaz was like, I I don't want a sign because he didn't really want to know what God's plan was. And God wanted to reveal it to him. And so he goes, I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you a sign anyway. And here's the sign. The virgin will be with child, will give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. Three things in there. There's a virgin. She's going to have it. She's going to get pregnant. That child has 50-50 chance, right, of being a boy or girl. We understand that. And, And he says, the child's going to be a son, it's going to be a boy, and the child's going to be given a name, and the name's going to be Emmanuel. In Luke chapter 2, verse 12, it says, this will be a sign to you, you will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. And when we read through the rest of that story, right, we know that <coughs> Mary was a virgin with child, she has a son, and they call him Emmanuel, God with us. Let me wrap up and say this. What is the conclusion and what is the takeaway from this idea of signs? Well, I think it's this, that we need to look at the world around us and see the precursors and even the signs. And they should cause us to live out our faith more steadfastly. As we see the day come, uh, time moving and the day of the Lord approaching, we should be more faithful Because Jesus says, be found faithful when he comes. So we should be more faithful, steadfast in our faith. Hold on, keep standing. They should also give us a sense of urgency to share the gospel. If we think that Jesus is coming back, that means the time that we have to share the gospel message with the lost is decreasing and therefore our preaching must increase while there's still time. And lastly, when we see these precursors and signs, they should give us a hope that God's coming is soon approaching and with Him will come glories of heaven. Paul says there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so when, the, when Jesus comes the second time, it's, it's going to be a, a tremendous event, but it will be a glorious event for those who are in Jesus. We don't have to fear. We don't have condemnation. We are not going to be cast out from his presence. We are going to hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Enter into thy master's rest. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this day that you've given us. Thank you, Father, for our time together to study through your word and to see the precursors, the signs that Jesus told us about 
uh, the coming of the end of the age. Uh, Father, the prediction about Jerusalem that came true that just reinforces um, his words and gives us strength and encouragement that if those things came true, that his coming again is going to come true. And Father, we long and truly believe in that. We know that he's coming for his church. Father, as we see the day approaching, may we grow stronger in our faith, more diligent in our preaching, more determined in reaching the lost, Father. And Father, may we have a hope of the glories to come and not a fear, Father, for there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And on that day, Father, we shall hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant, enter into thy master's rest. And in the words of John the Apostle, come Lord Jesus, come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I hope you guys all have a blessed evening. Thanks for being here tonight. We'll see you next week.